guess I need a microphone. I uh, got up here and realized I didn't have it, so I, uh, I went back and got it. Um, hope everyone is uh, is doing well this morning. Hope that uh, this is a, a good morning for each and every one of us. Uh, anybody have anything important that happened this week? <laughs> All right, since you uh, since you asked, uh, I'll I'll get I'll share with you a couple pictures. Uh, this is Elijah Daniel, uh, our our fifth child, fourth boy. Uh, he came into the world uh, Thursday morning at seven, uh, eight pounds, twenty one inches, uh, which is a runt by Snyder standards. So um, <laughs> he's the smallest we've had yet. So uh, I just want to, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank all of you for. Um, the prayers over the last nine months uh, for the love and and, uh, and compassion that you guys have shared with us over and over and over um, for uh, for Jeannie who's who's home I'm sure uh, she would share the same thing uh, thank you guys so much from the bottoms of our heart I'm excited to uh, for, for you guys to meet him and to get to know him and to, to love him the way we love him and uh, and I know that you will um, also excited to just come and worship with you guys uh, worship a, a, a king of creation a king that's it's uh, so worthy of all of our our praise and all of our uh, all of our worship, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, I want to begin this morning uh, by recognizing a, a guest who's here with us, um, Jim Estep. Uh, if you guys don't already uh, know Jim, you'll get to know him here in a bit. He is uh, currently the vice president um, at uh, Central Christian College. Um, he is uh, over academics, um, and uh, he is uh, part of a, a parachurch organization called E2. Uh, or effective elders, where he does uh, consulting and leadership training. Um, he's going to be doing that with uh, with this group of, of, of folks. And uh, Jim is here to uh, to worship and to eat along with us. And uh, and then we're going to have a presentation after that uh, on on what is the church. And he's going to uh, give that to us. And uh, and I hope that you'll uh, not just be uh, invited, but encouraged to to stick around for all of that today. Worship and and eat and uh, and come and and hear his presentation. So. Um, uh, I guess Lance has already talked to the kids a little bit, but kids, uh, if you don't already, you're going to need one of those sermon note sheets. Uh, it's going to uh, tell you about what we're doing today. You're going to listen uh, during the sermon for a word, and that word is body. Um, does any, any of the kids, do you know what it means to be the body of Christ? Jake, do you know what it means to be the body of Christ? Who's the body of Christ? God? Brantley, did you have it? Lance is pointing at you. What did you say first? Jesus, yes, he is the body, right? Uh, what does it mean to be part of the body of Christ? Gabby, help us out. One of the older kids. <laughs> Who's the body of Christ? The church, right? Yeah. And so we're going to talk about that today. We're just going to talk about what it means to be the body of Christ, what it means to be um, God's church uh, set, apart for, set apart for his purpose and, uh, and what that looks like within, uh, within the fellowship. Uh, as we continue on in a series we've been doing called Better Together, we're just talking about um, what it means to live in, in community. And so um, today we are listening for that word body. If you are a kiddo, if you are an adult, you can listen along with them and, uh, and maybe help them uh, put a sticker on the page uh, or, or color in something. Uh, last week we, uh, we opened up this, this uh, series with a, a look at just the communal need that we have, uh, that, that we have a need that is intrinsic to us as uh, God's creation, as, as people that he has placed on this, this planet for his purpose, uh, in his image, and because of that we have a communal need that is within us, and without that, that need being fulfilled, what we have is uh, isolation and loneliness, and, and we saw that right there from the very beginning of the Bible. You see this this picture of the the isolation and the loneliness that that Adam feels right there um, at, at in the garden at the beginning, and that that God calls us together in community um, to fulfill a need that we have to be with 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 people of of, uh, of like mind, uh, people most importantly who who again with us are knit together by one thing, and that one thing is the mercy of God. That because because God has shown us mercy, because God has so loved us that he would take our place and our sins and die in our place for those sins, um, that because of that, we have this, this community that is, is knit together by something that is so much greater than any other thing that we could possibly come together around, and that is the, the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we talked a little bit last week about uh, one of those letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to one church, uh, this early church that was in the city of Rome, the most important city in the world at the time, uh, the, the, the capital of the Roman Empire. And as he writes to this church, um, he tells them at the beginning of chapter 12, 
right? He says, therefore, because of everything that I've explained to you through the first 11 chapters, um, listen, I, I want you to hear this. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. And so because of what Jesus has done for, for us, because of all of the, the mercy that I've, I've explained for these 11 chapters, chapter 12, I want you to do something. I want you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And what, what uh, Paul is getting at here is that, that we, as a community, we come together in view of God's mercy to offer our bodies uh, as a sacrifice to the one who sacrificed himself for us, right? Uh, in view of his mercy to us and giving his life on, in our place for our sins, we give back our lives to him and we live for him today. He died for us. We live for, for him. And so in view of the, the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and what he has done for each and every one of us, we live as a sacrifice. This is our true and our proper worship. Um, and that's what Paul is, is getting at in that verse. And then he follows that up and he's giving us a picture of what genuine worship looks like. If you have a Bible with you and you'd like to open up to uh, Romans chapter 12, um, we're just going to follow through uh, what we just read in, chap in verse 1 and we're going to go into verse 2. Um, he says this, he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's, uh, what, what is, God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. And so what Paul is talking about here is that, that the community of Christ has been called um, to a community of transformation. That, that what we are doing is, is transforming into something. And so, you ready for a non-rhetorical question? Everybody nod with me so I know you're listening. Okay. What are we being transformed into? The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Somebody said the image of Christ. That was the one I was thinking of. The image of Christ. That, that, that the image of Christ is what we are being made into. If you've ever heard the word Christ-likeness, right? That's what we're, we're, we're looking for. Um, that, that each and every one of us who has ever been born is, is made in the image of God. But um, as, as saved people in view of God's mercy to us in Christ, um, we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind into the, the likeness of Christ, into the, the image uh, of the visible one who came and, and perfectly represented God to us. Uh, Colossians 1 says that, that he is the, the perfect image of the invisible God, that we know all of the quality of God through this one human being who has lived, uh, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Um, so much so that, that we see and we experience um, this, this world around us, um, and, and, uh, and we see that, that everything around us is trying to conform us, not to the image of Christ, but into the image of, of man, right? And so if you've ever, if you've ever uh, been alive, um, you've seen television ads, uh, you've seen radio, or heard radio ads, you've seen billboards, you've, you've uh, gotten direct mail, you've gotten email, you've gotten text messages, you're on social media, um, you walk down the, the department store uh, aisle to check out and you're, you're lined up with all of these magazines that are trying to do one thing and one thing only and that is conform you into the, the pattern of this world. Um, they, they want nothing more than for you to be like everyone else, to be normal, um, to be just like everyone else and, and to step outside of that conformity is to be weird and so they don't want to be weird. You don't want to be a, uh, you know, a, you know, someone outside of the bubble. You want to be right there where they want you to be. And so um, what, what we see is that, that uh, Paul says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what God's will is, so that you will move in Christ's likeness, so that you be transformed into the image of this risen Savior. Right? And so in Christ, we have a, a good news that is far greater than any marketing promise that we could ever have of happiness or success or beauty or excitement or acceptance. Um, all the things that the world says that you should run after, we have something so much better than that. And that is a risen Savior. That is, that is a promise fulfilled to us that, that one would come who would take away the sins of the world, who would, who would come and undo all of the sin that came from that very first in the, in the uh, opening chapters of the Bible. And so what we see is that, that conformity is what happens to us when we are shaped from the outside. Um, transformation is what happens when the Holy Spirit enters us and we are transformed from the inside. Um, first with the renewing of our mind, which works its way into our heart and then works its way out into our, our actions. And that's what the picture of repentance really is, this transformation. Um, it, it, it makes the church come to life. This, this transformation in the body of, of Christ is not a transformation as an institution 
or, or as an organization, but, but it's a transformation as an organism. That we are a living, breathing uh, body of Christ that, that is growing into Christ-likeness as we come together and iron sharpens iron. And, and we, we, uh, we exchange ideas and come to know the, the function and the, the picture of, of God that much better by, by being around like-minded people. That we're transformed into a people who, who care for others more than we care about ourselves. That we're, that we're transformed into a people who, who don't ask, what's in it for me? But rather, what can I do for you? Um, that we're transformed uh, over and over and over into a people who are, are freed from guilt and shame of our sin. And rather, we are ready to, in freedom, pursue holiness. Um, that, that we would run after what it is that God wants us to be and how he wants us to live um, so that we could be this, this glorious family of faith that is constantly inviting others to come and see. Um, that we would go and we would gather uh, up those people in our lives that need to know God and we would bring them into the fold and we would say this is what the family of God looks like. Um, transformation is not just from something. It's always to something. Right? Trans transformation isn't just uh, what was in the past. It's always what, what we're moving into. And so Paul wants to paint this picture to us. And so he gives it to us here in Romans uh, chapter 12, continuing on verse 3. He says, For by grace, uh, give it to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of you has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in, in Christ, we, though many, form one body, each member belonging to all of the others. And so this is the, the fundamental point that Paul is making in those verses, is that, that the church is not a team that you join. Um, the, the church is, is a place where you belong, right? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a club where you pay your dues. It, it is a, a, a body that you belong to. Two, um, there is only one group in all of the world in which the Holy Spirit dwells, and that is the body of Christ called the church. Um, that that it, is, it is completely unique and, and infinitely beautiful. Why? Because we are the body of Jesus Christ. And, and, and so we should never confuse um, Jesus Christ and, and the body of Christ with any other group in all of, all of, uh, all of creation. We shouldn't change it with, with any party or assembly. That the, 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 the body of Christ is, is wholly beautiful because we are the image of Christ to the world. And we are, are transforming into the image of the one in whose name that we carry. Because um, it is his name that is above every other name. right? It's, it's his name that is to be exalted over all of the others. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That he is, is God and man. That he is the King of King and he is the Lord of Lords. Amen. 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 He is majestic and he's mighty and no one compares to him. And because of who he is, he makes us beautiful. With all of our faults, all of our shortcomings, he makes us, us beautiful. And so through a, a meal that we partake of every single week, we remember this. We take these emblems that, that, that symbolize to us his life and his death and his resurrection. And so we take these emblems that, that symbolize his body and his blood and, and we and we take these emblems into ourselves and then we again remember what it is that he has done for each and every one of us and so i want to transition into this time of, of communion together and as we take this this communion together um just think about how we are the body of christ and i'm going to come and unpack some of that um, afterwards so i'm going to hand it over to Brian. So who's been watching the Olympics? Yep. Right? You don't have to watch them. But I'm a sports guy, so I watch the Olympics, right? And uh, get excited, sitting there watching our athletes compete against athletes from all around the world, the best of the best. And I was thinking, is they, you know, when one of our athletes win, they show video clips of the families back watching, right? They're back in the States watching because they can't be there and everybody's huddled around a TV and they're screaming and yelling and going all out for their, for their athlete. And if their athlete wins, there's jubilation. Um, and for what? They get a medal. 
So what did they give up for that medal? Those athletes have sacrificed everything for that little round medal. They have dedicated their entire life, everything that they are, their entire being has been sold in pursuit of that little tiny metal. Made out of gold, made out of silver, made out of bronze, pretty ribbon. Stand on a stage, hear your national anthem play, people applauding, fame and fortune. It's exciting. We love it. It's meaningless. In the eyes of the kingdom, it's meaningless. In Matthew chapter uh, 13, in uh, verses 44 and 45 and 46, Jesus tells a couple parables. And he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a, mind, uh, when a man finds it, uh, found it and hid it, over joy, he goes and he sells everything he has. And he goes back and he buys that field. And then he goes on to say, the kingdom of heaven is also like a, a fisherman that goes and he's searching for pearls and he finds the pearl of great price. The one that's worth more than anything on earth. And what's he do? He goes, he sells everything he has so he can buy that pearl. Well, when we come around this table, that's what we're remembering. The king of the cosmos, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, gave up everything for you and for me. Not for something that would perish, but for something that can be eternal. Because the Holy Spirit is our seal, it's our sanctification, it's our guarantee for a future pride, which is us being in eternal fellowship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christ gave up everything. He made himself nothing. Not for a medal on a fancy ribbon. Not for fame and fortune. Not for the applause of man. But for you. And for you. And for me. And for all of us. There was a rich young ruler that came to Jesus and he said, Good teacher, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, knowing the man's heart, said, Go and sell all you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. That is transformation. That has value. That is eternal. Not the little metal. Not the little trophy. Not the, anything that we consider to be valuable in our life that we pursue. On our jobs, on our careers, on our paycheck. Nothing. Jesus says, full surrender. Lay it at my feet. And at the end of time, I will give you a crown of righteousness. That's what we remember when we come around this table. So I have a challenge for you today. And Sean brought it up in his message. Are we doing this because we want to be part of a club? Are we doing this because we just like the fellowship? Or are we pursuing transformed hearts that will turn into transformed lives for Christ and for his kingdom? So when Paul commands us to come around the table and examine ourselves, that's one of the things he's asking us to do. Are you sold out for Jesus? Have you sold everything that you have? Have you given it all away in pursuit of that pearl of great price or that hidden treasure? Because I'm going to tell you right now, before the foundation of the world, God set in motion the plan of salvation that would lead Christ to the cross and would lead us to a decision that means we decide to surrender or we decide to walk away. 
So as you come to the table this morning to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, ask yourself that question. Am I the rich young ruler? Or have I surrendered everything I have to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, mighty God, we thank you. We honor you. We worship you. There is none greater. There is none who loves more. There is none who cares more. And there is none who has given more than you. Thank you for showing us who you are in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for laying out the plan of salvation long before you said, let there be light. We lift your name on high this morning, Lord, as we come around your table and we worship you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Let us ask ourselves the question, have I surrendered all to Jesus, the name above all other names? For it's in his name we pray. Amen. I can tell that I'm sleep deprived because uh, as I closed my eyes to pray, I didn't want to open them back up. <laughs> um, if you have a Bible with you uh, or a device with a Bible app, uh, open up to 1 Corinthians 12. That's where we're going to camp out for a minute. 
uh, this morning and look at the beautiful picture of the body that we belong to. 1 Corinthians 12, um, Paul is writing to a church, a single church again, um, that had dealt with a whole bunch of issues, um, that it was, a, it was a troubled church. And so he's writing to them uh, to give them instruction and to answer some questions that they have and to, uh, to correct some things. And, and during this, this explanation to them, in verse 12, he says this. He says, For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. And so he's, he's painting this, this picture here in this, this one sentence. You, you can really see the focus of what he's trying to do here. Um, if you count the number of times it says body, just in that one sentence, there's, there's three times that he says body. Um, if you count the number of times that he says member, uh, there's two times that he says member. Right? He's, he's, he's creating a repetition here. He's talking about the body of Christ and members of that body and, and what that, that comes to look like. And, and this really sets the tone for, for everything that's going to follow. So from this verse through the end of this chapter in verse 31, um, 36 times he's going to say body, member, or part. Um, I, I chose to use the ESV as I was going through this rather than the, the NIV or the NASB because he talks about the member. Uh, and I think that's an important word here um, that he, he, he uses. And there's a, there's a reason for that. Because um, everywhere that you hear the word membership, um, it, whether that is uh, from a club or a team or a big box store, if you are a member somewhere, um, it has its origin in this idea right here in Christianity. Um, that, that Paul saying that we are members of a body um, is, the, is actually the etymology for that idea of, of membership. Um, belonging to a body. Uh, and so there is this comparison that Paul is making here. He says, just as the body is one but has many members, so it is with Christ. Um, that, that we ho who are many form one body. There is, is unity in, in the body. Um, and how, how, much, how much would you say that, that the parts of your body are part of you, right? If you were to look at your foot, would you consider that to be part of your body? Well, of course you would. Um, you'd, you'd look at it and be like, yeah, that's my foot, right? Uh, my hand, uh, my ear, my eye. Um, they, they're all parts of, of me, of, of who I, I am. And so Jesus says, just like that. That is how you, Christian, um, brother or sister, that's how you are viewed in the eyes of Christ, that you are part uh, of, of him. That, that because you are part of him, you are part of the, the whole that he puts together as the body of Christ. And, and that's what makes Christian community utterly unique and unlike anything else in this world. That the church is united together as the body of Jesus Christ. That, that Paul says, as he continues on in verse 13, he says, for, one, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. We are all made to drink of the one spirit, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And so Paul uh, has shown us the beauty of the unity of the church, that, that though we are many, we are one in Christ. Now he's going to show us the beauty of the diversity of the body, right? Though we are one body, we are many different things. We are many different members. We are di many different parts. And Paul is going to show us that the body of Christ thrives, not in spite of our differences, but because of our differences. That, that it's, not, it's not because, or it's not in spite of, of the things that we have that are different, but it's because we are all different, but coming together under the mercy of God, under the headship of Christ, because of that, we actually are something very, very beautiful. And so let me clarify just that, that sentence, that idea of the body of Christ um, not, not thriving in spite of our differences, but because of our differences. Um, there are many who would say, um, it's great that, that though we have all of these, these differences, though, though we're different in all of these different ways, right? In spite of that, we all get together and we do this or that, right? And, and, and that would be completely true, but, but it, it misses the point of what Paul is actually saying. What Paul is actually saying is that, that there are differences that we have, but those things aren't negative. They're not unfortunate. Um, rather, uh, they, they are things that actually that we need to press into. <laughs> that things that, that because of our differences and coming together, um, there is a puzzle that is being fit together. And, and the pieces fit in place the way that God intended them to fit. Um, there was a Discover Card uh, commercial many years back. Uh, you might remember this commercial. And the, the girl calls up Discover Card and she's on the phone. 
and she's, she's surprised when she gets a human being, first of all, and so she's excited, and so she starts talking to the girl on the other end, uh, only to find out the girl on the other end is her. You guys remember that commercial? Uh, and so uh, as, as she's talking to her, she's like, hey, I, I really like you, right? Because you're me, right? And if, if we're not careful, that same mindset kind of makes its way into the church. And we, we, we start to think to ourselves, man, things would be so much better if everybody was just like me. Um, if everybody did what I do, if everybody thought like I think, if everybody was me, um, things would, would run a lot smooth, smoother because I've got it all figured out, right? I, people just need to be like me. Um, have you ever thought about what the church would look like if it was just filled with you? Uh, I took some time this week, uh, just a little bit of time because that's all I could stand, um, to think about what the church would look like if it was just me. Um, if it was if it was a, a bunch of people, little Sean's running around um, everywhere you looked, um, which is kind of how my house looks, but um, <laughs> if everyone were just like me, we would be an outgoing bunch. Like I'm an extrovert, so we'd be outgoing. Uh, we'd be hugely funny, like hilariously funny. You know that, right? Uh, you'd be a handsome group. <laughs> Thanks, <monkey. laughs> but. We would be a group completely devoid of any musical talent whatsoever. Can't hold a tune, doesn't, doesn't know how to read sheet music, uh, doesn't know good music from bad music other than to be like, I don't like that, right? Uh, we would be a, a, a devoid of any musical talent. Uh, we would be uh, a group that, that might love spending time talking about Jesus over coffee, um, but, but fails to see things outside of their own, their own lens. Like, I, I, I really struggle with just seeing things critically. Um, I, I like the way that things are. I get used to them. I'm very loyal in, the, in my approach. And so I, I struggle to just look at things critically and see where they, they have shortcomings. Uh, and and I, I need others to help me with that. Um, we would be a, a group that is devoid of, of passion ministries um, that, that look out for the, the, the people around us that are less fortunate. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm so devoid of, of that just being part of my being. Um, that I need people around me who, who have that lens, who have that, that picture of, of people around them. I, we would be a group of people who, who at a moment would, would say, yes, I want to be part of that prayer ministry. And then three days later says, hey, let's play disc golf um, because that happened to me last Sunday. Um, I, I, I committed to a prayer ministry only to, to three days later, someone asked me about disc golf on the exact same day. I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. Right, because I'm, I'm just not organized in my thoughts the way that I need to be. I, I need others to come together and, and, and to, to actually merge an idea in the way they did this Wednesday when a group of men got together and they played disc golf and they prayed for this, this body of believers. Um, and it's such a beautiful thing, the way that, that my shortcomings are actually becoming uh, a beautiful thing because others think outside of the way that I think. Um, and so that's what Paul's talking about here. That, that if, if everybody was just like you, it might be good for you for a minute, but, but you would get pretty annoyed by that pretty quickly, and, and the church would never be what it's supposed to be, which is the body of Christ, the, all of the different diversity coming together in unity and, and, and serving the function for which God has, has fashioned you together. We should never actually wish that we were all the same. That's what Paul's saying. So let me show you this straight from, from God's Word. Look at verse 14. It says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would, no, it would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the he sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If... Uh, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. And so again, he's showing us the picture here that, that there is unity and there is diversity. And these things are, are not opposed to each other. They actually are, are beautiful pictures of the same thing, the body of Christ, that we are united under the mercy of what he has done for us, under the diversity of how he has created each and every one of us to live which is completely amazing when you actually stop and you think about it. Um, it. It's amazing to think about the way that God in his creativity has given each and every one of us a unique expression of his grace. All of these different people coming together and all of them necessary for, for the beauty of the body of Christ to shine. 
Like, like think about that for just a minute. There are all these, all of these different members, all these different people, all of these different expressions of God's grace in this room, different backgrounds. Uh, Paul says it this way in verse 13. He says, Jew and Greek, slave and free. Right? Different expressions of God's grace in these, these times that he's writing to. He says all of them come together in one body and their beauty shines not because they're all alike, but because they are so different. And yet, they are part of one body set apart by one spirit, baptized into one Christ. We all have unique talents and, and gifts and strengths and abilities and that, that makes each and every one of us not just valuable, but necessary. And that's important for us to, to wrap our minds around. That, that it's not just that if you're not involved in community, the way that, that God has, has fashioned us to live together in community, that you're missing out on something, which is true. That's true. You'll miss out on something by not being part of a community. But the body of Christ is missing something as well. Because you are necessary for the body to function the way that God has fashioned it to function. You are depriving the body of something that it desperately needs by not leaning into what God has called you into in community. And so you say, Sean, how, how do you figure that, right? Well, because the church exists for a, a mission much larger than any one of us. Um, and if, if, the, if the entire mission of the church was just for you to be saved, then if you're saved, good, that's, we're done. Let's all go home. But that's not the mission of the church. The mission of the church is that we would, we would go and we would find others and we would invite them to come and to see the beauty of our maker, that they would see the love that we share and they would share in that love for the body of Christ. And they would come to believe and they would come to be baptized and they would come to, to place their lives into the, the body of Christ so that they would be connected with, with where they are necessary for, for God to, to continue to show his grace to the world around it. So the church is on a mission to care for each and every one of not just the members of this room, but, but of this community and this city and this state and this world that, that we are called to care for uh, people who are inevitably hurt. Skip down to verse 24 and you can see how, how, how uh, Paul talks about this in God's word. He says, but God is has so comp composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there are many, uh, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And so the picture he's, he's giving us here is a picture of a people so bound together that they experience life together. The highs and the lows of life, they experience and fellowship, that, that when you rejoice, I rejoice, right? That, that when you are suffering, I'm feeling the weight of, of your trials and your hardships, um, that, that that's the way the body is to function. Uh, a lot has happened in this last week of mine, right? And so I, I look back on it, and on Friday I was kind of decompressing at a, at a hospital, uh, and, and we're, we're thinking back on just the, just the, the gravity of everything that, that transpired over those days, and, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking, Man, a lot has happened. So what has happened in your life in the last seven days? I, I don't know that. If, if the totality of Christianity to me is, is showing up on a Sunday morning and saying, how are you? And having you say, oh, I'm fine. Right? If, if that's all it is, then I'll never know exactly what is going on in your life. I'll never be able to, to, to share in your suffering. <laughs> I'll never be able to, to share in your, your rejoicing. Because I don't know what's going on in your life and you don't know what's going on in mine and, and so we need each other we need to feed off each other so that we can we can share in, in the suffering that each of us has and when one mourns we all mourn together as if it were our own body that, that when one rejoices we all celebrate together as if it were our own body we're, we're we were talking uh, last Sunday um, in, in our, our family group, we were getting together. We were talking about just the, the sermon from the week before. And uh, we were talking about uh, counterfeit community and, and the way that that is all around us. That there are counterfeits for what community looks like. 
Um, and, and probably the, the easiest one to see is, is social media because um, we, we live our lives for other people and, and, uh, and for their appreciation to be seen by them and to be liked by them, right? And, and, uh, and you get this idea of, of this community of people, but it's all counterfeit, right? And so if, if you were to, to think through your own life, how many friends would you say you actually have? Um, how, how many people do you think you could confide in and, 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 and you know, share you know, your deepest regrets or, or problems with or, or people that you, you want to let know every single time you're celebrating something? How many people would you say that that is? Is it 100? Is it 50? Is it 20? Okay, so I noticed this week as I'm looking on, on Facebook, I have 855 friends on a list, right? I have 855, that's not even that, that many, really. Um, I, I know my, my wife actually has more friends than I do. Imagine that. Um, and, and I'm looking through this list of friends, and I noticed that somebody who I've known for the last 15 years, who's been a, a, a member of that list for the last decade, is no longer on that list. And I, and I thought about it, and I thought, how counterfeit. If, if someone can remove me from their life by the click of a button, you know what I didn't have? A friendship. I hear all the time people talking about being spurned by the church or people being hurt by the church. And, and, and not to belittle that that happens. But what I have experienced in my life so many more times is, is um, people who imagine what other people are thinking. People who, who, who uh, put motives to what other people do, and, and they slowly pull away from the church. And, and let me just tell you, if, if you show me someone who is, is pulling away from the body of Christ, I will show you someone who is pulling away from the head of the body, Christ. Um, that, that we need each other to function the way that we're supposed to. We need to be in constant community and fellowship with each other on a daily basis, meeting from house to house, loving on one another, sharing in the, the grief of one another, sharing in the celebrations of, of one another. Uh, the, the gospel, it actually prompts me, more than me, it prompts us, <laughs> it, it, it prompts each and every one of us to look beyond ourselves and into this idea of what Christian community actually looks like. As we become part of this, this body that, that is uh, so beautiful because it is the body of Christ. A, a body that, that wants us to see how we can serve one another. Uh, a, a body that, that wants us to examine how we can celebrate with one another. A, a body that, that, that wants us to see how we can mourn and encourage one another over and over and over. And this gospel it not only beckons us to see community this way, but it, it, it beckons us to see community outwardly. So that we're not so inwardly focused that we're not outwardly uh, uh, imagining what it looks like for people to come and see the beauty uh, of what God has put together in community. Because he said he, we will be known as his disciples by our love for one another. And that love for one another will invite others to come and see what it is that makes us love one another so deeply. And, and be involved in each other's lives so completely. When the, when the church becomes the body of Christ... We live in community for the mission of the one who is the head, for Christ. This is, this is not just any body. This is the body of Christ, and it's on display, uh, and, and it is ministering to one another, and it is ministering to the love, uh, to, to the community around us out of mutual love. And, and that's what God wants us to see, to be, and to feel as, as we each belong to him. We all belong to one another, and every single member performs its role within the body. That's what makes the body so beautiful. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you again for a day that we can come and we can revel in how you have knit us together. Father, as we, as we uh, come together and we celebrate who you are, and we, we take these, these emblems of your life given for each and every one of us, and we look back on, on how you have, have saved us and what you have saved us for, what you've transformed us from and what you're transforming us into. Um, Lord, we just ask that you would continue to, to push us forward into the likeness of Christ. Um, not individually, but, but collectively. That, that 
over and over and over, we together would, would be a living sacrifice to your glory, ready to, to live out your purpose because it is our true and proper sense of what it looks like to worship you in this world. And so, Father, as we come to you this morning and, and we, we uh, confess our shortcomings, we confess our sins, we, we know where we have failed, Father, we ask you to, to, to again, renew us in your Son. Uh, bind us together under the unity of his mercy. And Father, in the diversity with which we come together, help us to love and to serve and to celebrate and to mourn and, and to, to help and to encourage one another. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Stand and sing with us.